Welcome back to Starting a Private Practice. And today we're diving into frequently asked questions about developing your marketing message. I'm Miranda Palmer. And I'm Kelly Higdon. We want to help you hone in who you serve and how you serve them well. So we're going to answer some of those questions right now. Let's start with one of my favorite questions is, what if I and my client are kind of similar? What if I have been through this experience? Should I self-disclose in my marketing? <laughs> Ooh, this is a juicy one. Um, and I think for a lot of different reasons, I think one of the, when, when I was first working, I remember I worked for domestic at a domestic violence center and it was absolutely not okay to do any self-disclosure. And there were definitely times when I thought this could be so much easier if I could just say, here's been my experience. And then I learned something really important through that time, which was that when you speak um, from an empathetic, informed place, your clients get that you get it and your story doesn't get in the way. Mm -hmm. And it is not necessary to ever say, hey, I had this experience for people to not get, oh, you have this experience. Now, this is not to say that there could not be times when you choose to self-disclosure in your marketing, but I always want to start with that place of you can absolutely attract amazing clients and they can get that you get it just by the way you speak of, speak of it. You don't have to self-disclose in your marketing to have a waiting list, to have a full practice. It is not a necessity. It is an option. I think what does happen is that when people do the journaling exercise and they start to realize, oh my gosh, this client is me. Is that okay? Mm. And it feels really close to home. And for us, we believe you just need to be a little further in your healing to feel comfortable mm -hmm. to work with a specialty that is very much in your own experience in your personal life. And if you're not self-disclosing, but you're using your experience to allow for that attunement in the messaging, that is sufficient, but it is normal mm -hmm. to get a little, little freaked out, you know, <laughs> when you realize like, oh my gosh, I'm writing to myself. Mm -hmm. That is very, very, very common. You are not alone in that. And it's very normal to, because you are feeling maybe a little insecure about it to try to use the self-disclosure to shortcut the claiming of your brilliance, just to say, oh, hey, we have this thing in common. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about that is it does give an opportunity for a couple of things. If you're going to self-disclose, number one, realize you can't like put the toothpaste back in the tube easily. Mm -hmm. Once you put something out on the internet, it is out on the internet. Yeah. Um, and there are going to be people who are going to use that information in ways that you did not intend. Um, and sometimes even your self-disclosure can be impactful to other people. It might be impactful to your children or to a, a partner or spouse or family members. Sometimes your experience is not just your own, it impacts other people. So it's really important to look at all the different pieces and feel really good about the self-disclosure. And again, I, I find that when it comes to um, like, that's a different bar than when you're self-disclosing client to client, mm -hmm. like in person. Right. Um, and that that's definitely a different bar for me. And I think also think about the space of what that looks like long-term. Mm -hmm. So when I was in private practice, I didn't self-disclose a lot. I remember even when I wrote a picture, I wrote a blog about um, cleaning out my purse and feeling like, oh, this is very like vulnerable. <laughs> um, and it, it had a, like, it had a whole theme as to what it was. And I got clients who were like, oh my gosh, I read that blog. And like, mm -hmm. I knew that you were my person, um, but I didn't talk about my marital status. I didn't talk about my abuse history. I didn't talk about my neurodivergence. I didn't talk about any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started doing coaching, I felt much more comfort, comfortable and confident to talk about my marital status, to talk about my parenting status, having a child, all those kinds of things. And then when I went through a divorce, 
suddenly I was like, oh, now I didn't really think about that piece. I had never planned on getting divorced. Mm -hmm. Um, So suddenly that became a lot more vulnerable um, because I had talked so openly um, about my relationship status. And so, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think I would undo that decision, but I will say there was a moment a lot of moments, probably like a year or two in the midst of going through the divorce process where I felt like I needed to shrink back because Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was still working through, um, the divorce process and it felt really uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, another question that we have gotten is what if I don't want just one type of person coming in to see me? I started with couples and I can't handle a full caseload of couples. <laughs> I, uh, that is, a, again, another one of those common fears that if I speak to one kind of person, that that's all I will see in my practice. But the truth is that people will identify with different parts of that person that you you conjure up in your messaging. And then your clients are going to refer people they trust to you as well. And you will have diversity in your practice. Even if you had a single page website that only spoke to one niche, you will still have diversity in your practice because as people get to know you and meet you, I don't know, I still get referrals and I'm not in practice now because people just know like, Hey, Kelly's a therapist. I'll call her, you know, because I've, I have friendships and relationships and it's not even about a niche. And so starting with a niche, will when we get into the marketing plan, it will help guide you, but know that people already know you, like you and trust you to refer to you. And I also, I always love to tell a story of the very first client that I got for my website. My website was super niche to overwork Christian women. And I got the partner, the spouse of of a Christian woman that had nothing to do with the overworked Christian woman. They were dealing with um, a sex addiction. And mine was the opposite. I specialized in men and I got all their partners. (laughs) So, you know, it, you will still have that diversity. Mm -hmm. And at any time, please hear us at any time. If you discover I am burnt out or I don't want to work with this niche anymore, you can pivot. You are never locked in. I think that's the other part too, is that you can also, once you start getting consistent referrals in that area, then you have time and space to write up another marketing message, to develop a marketing plan and to add into that. So over time, my website expanded where it was overworked Christian women Um, I had a page that was specific to trauma. I had a page specific to EMDR. I had a page specific to couples therapy. You have time to create these other spaces. Now there was a cute, there was a very clear theme through my website as to what I was about. Um, But I had specialty pages for some of these specific little sub niches Mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to work with. Another question. What if I have five niches that I know I want to work with? Um, as I'm starting out my practice, how do I address all of them? You don't initially. I know that's so frustrating, um, but trying to speak to all of them initially, not helpful. Even if you could just do one marketing message a month over five months and get the hang of how to write them and getting that in place, that's going to be better next time, not next week. Next week, we're going to be Um, diving into a coaching session regarding developing a marketing message. But after that, we're going to be talking about marketing plans. And I think that's a really important piece of this is that having a bunch of marketing messages together and never having an actual marketing plan to get them seen by your ideal clients Mm -hmm. isn't going to, isn't going to be workable. And if you have five different types of clients that you're trying to market to all at once, and you don't have marketing flow and processes down for just one, you're going to stretch yourself thin. Yeah. You're not going to be able to leverage things. So there's a there's a method to why we really recommend starting with one niche and giving yourself time to really learn how to do the marketing well and how to speak to this client well, so that when you master that, then you can continue that skill into other niches. Yeah. Then you can rinse and repeat in a lovely way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's another question. What if 
my ideal client speaks multiple languages Mm -hmm. and so do I. How do I determine what language to put my marketing message in? Right. There's a couple of things at play here. Um, You can first Google to see what keywords are used. And sometimes you will find Spanish words or or another language. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. Spanish because it's very common in business school, but you'll find another language is searched for. So usually you'll have at least some English version so that Google can search it. And then if there are keywords, you want to be sure you're using those in whatever language um, you have found to be ranked that you want to rank for. Mm -hmm. And then we believe like you do what is right for you. Are you doing your entire session in that language? Maybe you want a page fully in that language then. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're a person who mixes and goes back and forth, maybe in your marketing message, you're going to have some of those phrases that you would commonly use that that person would be like, oh, we can speak my language in the session. And there's a back and forth fluidity, you know, Mm -hmm. that that all of me is welcome here and all the different ways that I um, speak and communicate. Yeah. Cause I, I think it is, it's so powerful for someone to be able to, um, to speak in their native language, Mm -hmm. to be able to move back and forth um, Mm -hmm. between that. Just like a funny side, not not funny, but little side note. I had a client um, that was blocked and we were doing EMDR and it took me so long to get the client to say, just speak with what's going on. She kept trying to interpret for me and and move it from her native language of Spanish to English. She was fully Mm -hmm. bilingual, but a lot of emotional things will come up in a native language. And so getting her to, to feel comfortable and confident. And then as soon as she would start to just speak in Spanish, which was her native language, it was like, oh, things started to flow. Mm-hmm. And it didn't matter in my particular case, whether I understood it, it would have been beneficial, but there was very few. There was actually only one. Um, hmm. you one no, there was only one bilingual therapist in my city, which was like highly, um, highly Hispanic. Um, it was, it was really sad. So, you know, those are things that happen. I think too, this not, this doesn't apply to just, uh, language, but also idioms and like their terminology that might be very tied to a culture that you serve Mm -hmm. or that you are a part of. So this is that deconstructing where we've colonized a lot of our language and being comfortable with showing up as who we are. Maybe it's not, again, we talked about self-disclosure earlier. It's just more about being authentically yourself so that when someone comes in to see you, what they read on that page is what they get in the session, that they have that same kind of sentiment or vibe or feeling that they have reading that as they do when they are working with you. Okay, here's the last question. I think mm-hmm. this is a big one. I thought I created an amazing marketing message. It like brought tears to my own eyes. I had friends read it. They're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And then it didn't work because nobody called me. Hmm. What happened? Sometimes it's not about the message. It's about where you put the message. So when we get into the marketing plan, we'll be talking about, is that message being seen by the people who need it? Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's the piece, right? Is that you need an actual marketing plan to get the message out there, to get that marketing plan to page one of Google, or to get that marketing plan being shared on, or that marketing message being play, bleh, shared um, on social media. So we'll be diving into that. But next week, we're going to dive in with an amazing therapist that's gonna let us peek behind the curtain at developing their marketing message, the struggles they've been having. Um, If you are a voyeur of loving to see (laughs) other people struggling in their private practice. You wanna know you're not alone. You wanna know you're not alone. Now's the time. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening today. I hope this answered your frequently asked questions. Feel free to go and post. Let us know if there are more questions you'd like to have answered. And of course, rate us on wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you're looking for more support, we have over 15 hours of free training. And of course, our business school for therapists. That is super rad. And you can find it all at zinnime.com forward slash pod. We'll see you guys next time.